Welcome, everybody, to today's One Million by One Million Strategy Roundtable for Entrepreneurs. Uh, some of you have been here before, others you are here for the first time. So um, the mission of One Million by One Million is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars in annual revenue and beyond, build a trillion dollars in global GDP and 10 million jobs by 2020. Um, as you can tell, this is a very ambitious, audacious mission. and. Uh, the only way we're going to succeed is if you all succeed. You, know, you all who are part of the One Million by One Million program or are planning to become part of the One Million by One Million program, we would like to put all our resources behind you so that you can succeed, and that's the only way we can succeed in achieving our mission. So our success is completely pinned on your success. So this is our 107th roundtable. We've been doing this for a long time, and um, we normally have mostly entrepreneur pitches, but uh, right now we are towards the end of the year, and this is when all these trend analysis and opportunity analysis for the next year starts to kick in. So um, I am going to show you a few, um, few pieces of trend analysis and opportunity analysis that I have done and trend spotting that I have done as part of today's program as well. And also we will have our customary uh, entrepreneur pitches and, and uh, discussion sessions. Uh, now this roundtable is being recorded and it will be available to you to listen or share afterwards. Um, we have a number of Twitter IDs that you can follow us on and, and there's always live tweeting going on from the at 1M by 1M account. Um, if you are live tweeting this show, please use the hashtag 1M1M. And uh, we also have a very active Twitter channel through my personal Twitter handle, and that handle is at Stromana. Um, in fact, uh, those of you who, are, uh, who follow that handle probably know that we also um, make that channel available for our 1 million by 1 million members to use to reach out to their... Uh... So the first thing we're going to talk about today is, um, is an open problem that I see uh, and I hope is going to be solved in 2012 by some you know, enterprising entrepreneur. It's the problem of social contact. Now, all of us are doing lead generation. Any entrepreneur who is working uh, seriously, has to do some level of lead generation. You know, we have to, what do entrepreneurs do? We sell and we market. And uh, the problem of lead generation is front and center usually in, uh, in the minds of entrepreneurs. Now, just to give you a little bit of background, in the mid-90s, uh, my second company was in the field of using technology to do lead generation. And that was a time when I delved very deeply into the topic of lead generation and how to use technology to do lead generation. And you know, once you do something like that, that psychology of trying to understand how lead generation as a problem or any problem can be scaled with technology becomes ingrained in your psyche. So I have spent a, an inordinate amount of time thinking about the lead, lead generation problem, and since I've been an entrepreneur or working with entrepreneurs all through my career, this has been you know, very much top of mind for me for years and years and years. I would say probably about 15 years that I've been thinking about lead generation as a problem. Right now, you know, in the uh, two, 2010 to 2020 decade, the lead generation problem is going through a very, very significant change. And I would tell, uh, like to say that we observed a change like this in the mid-90s with the advent of the Internet. The lead generation changed in the mid-90s as the Internet kicked into gear. So before that, lead generation used to be a direct mail and telephone problem. So the only kind of information you wanted on a lead at that time was segmentation information and also mailing, you know, mailing address and telephone numbers. In the 90s, that changed to the 
anything to do with the internet becoming a becoming a critical issue. If you were doing B two B or B two C, definitely email address was becoming a critical factor in finding leads. And if you were doing B two B lead generation, then the URL of your of the company that your uh, target was attached to was becoming an issue because you wanted to do checking on what whom you were selling to. Now, all through the 2001 to 2010 decade, we saw that kind of evolving. And just around 2000, 2000, 2000 is when LinkedIn kicked into gear, even though it didn't really become a mainstream phenomenon until much later in the decade. But LinkedIn has become today a, a major factor in lead generation because most leads that we are trying to reach have a LinkedIn profile. So, typically, in the selling cycle, connecting with your leads on LinkedIn is becoming a major issue. So you need to know the LinkedIn profile and preferably also the email address of the target audience of your lead list. You also want to know the other social media touch points. So today, you know, I have to monitor my Twitter account because there are lots of people who are direct messaging me on Twitter. And and these are leads who are got an email the other day, uh, a direct message on Twitter, not even an email, a direct message on Twitter saying, um, Vivek Wadwa asked me to contact you uh, to join the One Million by One Million program, and I'm doing such and such company. Well, as far as One Million by One Million con is concerned, this is a potential customer, and that customer needs to be serviced. There's a touch point, there's a whole new touch point that has opened up via Twitter. Similarly, we have another touch point that has opened up, which is Facebook. I constantly get messages from you know, potential customers or people who want who in the one million by one million community who want to who want to connect with me through Facebook. So all these touch points, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, these are touch points that have to be now monitored. So um, the counterpoint of that is any lead list that you are developing needs to have all these other, you know. Uh, Rec uh, items in the record. If you're looking at a, a lead as a record in your CRM system or in your email marketing system, you need to bring in email, not only email, but LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, all these other profile information for that particular lead. And that is a very cumbersome process. There is no way, let's say you somebody comes to you via Twitter, or you identify somebody as a lead via Twitter, there's no automated way to plug that Twitter ID in somewhere and immediately get the other touch points like email, like phone number, like mailing address, like LinkedIn profile, like Facebook, all these other pieces. Or if you have the email address, filling in the other fields of that record in the database. And this is a problem that I have labeled as social contacts. So the range of what your lead needs to cover in terms of database fields is much broader today than it used to be in the, in the pre-internet era and in the pre-social media era. What we are seeing right now is the advent of social media into selling and marketing and and that social selling and social marketing is what's creating demand for social contact databases. And I have not seen, to this day, I have not seen any, um, any way to locate social contact databases using technology. So in my mind, it's an open problem. And by the way, if any of you have seen a solution to this problem, uh, by the way, my public chat is open, so if you want to talk about, if you, want, if you have ideas about where to find a solution like this, you're most welcome to share that here. 
but if you're an entrepreneur looking for an idea to zero in on, you can definitely look at this opportunity and start researching this opportunity as a possible business to build because I am pretty sure that this is a business that is going to be very interesting in the upcoming years. And, and I'll tell you how I solve this problem. We actually solve this problem on a very manual basis. We have um, web research teams, offshore web research teams who sit and research all this information for us by hand. It's a very tedious, extremely cumbersome, extremely time consuming and expensive process. And right now that's what's happening in the industry. That is the state of the union in the industry. So do you have any questions on this particular topic? The public chat is open. If you have any questions, you're very welcome to, um, or any comments, you're very welcome to participate in this, on this topic in the public chat. And folks, uh, for, this, for the moment, please limit your questions to the topic that I'm discussing. I know you guys are discussing other things in the public chat, but uh, your questions to me on other topics, hold that for the general Q&A session, which we're going to do towards the end of the show. So I don't see any questions or comments on this particular opportunity of social contacts and lead generation yet. is saying there's a technology limitation. I'm sure there's a technology limitation. It's, uh, but you know, these are essentially search technologies that, uh, that need to be deployed to, to make this happen. Yes, that is also true. There are technology limitations offered by the platform. So LinkedIn will not allow a search engine to go in and, and look up the LinkedIn profiles. But having said that, often uh, that information actually comes up on Google as well. But this is all public information, uh, Shashank. Um, Shashank is saying, aren't there privacy issues to worry about when you're digging more info on a particular person? Um, at some level, yes, but you know, uh, people who are doing marketing are pretty much accessing mailing addresses, email addresses, um, and other publicly available information. Your LinkedIn profile is publicly available. If you choose to make your LinkedIn profile public, it is publicly available, so it's public information. Your Twitter ID is public, your Facebook ID is public. Whether you choose to connect with people or not, it's, that's completely up to you. But uh, but people looking for that information and trying to find that information, that is not, uh, that is certainly not, does not violate any privacy issue. Yeah, screen scraping of some sort potentially. Status says social networks seem to be more important for partnerships than for direct client sales. You know, that is not our experience. It depends on where your client base is hanging out. Uh, if your client base hangs out in social media, then social media is just as important for, for client sales, actually. Because a lot of clients are finding you through social media. Um, I think. Uh, Sudhi said earlier that uh, he was looking at the blog discussion on fresh desk versus then desk, and uh, and he talks about how he found one million by one million through that discussion, and and yeah, blogs is another actually a lot of your uh, a lot of your uh, clients are hanging out on Facebook on blogs and so on and so forth, and and those are very, very important touch points to find, uh, find customers also, direct customers. 
Yes, and Sudhi, your point is absolutely correct. Facebook is Facebook generates a tremendous, tremendous amount of traffic and customers. Because everybody's on Facebook these days, you know, billion people on Facebook. Well, you know, that's bound to be a big source of uh, customers. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next segment. If you want to discuss this further, we'll come back to it in the general Q&A session, okay? Uh, and the next segment is status talking about his business, and I'm going to work with, uh, with, uh, with status on his business right now. Um, so, so the concluding point on social contacts is definition of a lead database has changed to include social media contact information. There is definitely a gap in a solution provider that takes lead lists and converts them into a fully populated database that covers all those different fields. Okay, Status um, is calling. Status. Hi, good morning. Hi, uh, Status splits his time between Greece and UK, and uh, is the well, car rental broker. Right. Head Status. Yes, right now here is uh, six thirty. I like to say hi to everyone participating today, and thank you for having me here today. So tell us what does car rental brokers do? We we have uh, we are a team of uh, two people. When we have started about uh, four or five years ago, we have been building a system together with uh, Tristan, my partner, uh, to 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 offer to the people that need uh, car rental information worldwide. Uh, having the experience uh, from this industry for many many years working with uh, big well-known companies, we have decided that we need to do something to, first of all, support the local market after the internet expansion, and of course to give more accurate information to the people that are looking to find detailed information through a booking system. So when we have started for four years, we were not operating. We just building the system with the latest technology. And about two years ago was the time when we we have uh, gone uh, live. And since then, we have been fixing every problem we found on our way. And right now, we we have finalized the the technology part of it. So we are ready now to just only have to work with designs. And uh, these last two years, uh, we we had about 150,000 people quoting cars through our system. Uh, of course, not all of them booking. So, uh, Sanders, and right now, uh, precise mm -hmm. what happens on your site is uh, what, what exactly what are you doing? We we take the information from the local car rental suppliers around the world, from small and global car rental operations. We we work with it and we we then give this information detailed through our website. So is that like a like hotels.com for car rentals, for instance? Exactly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. All right. Keep going. Got it. Go ahead. So at the moment we we first of all uh, I have to mention at this point that I have been watching your about last ten uh, round tables and I got a lot of information. I may I may have to have many many questions today, but after watching you for the last ten ten last times, I actually came up with some. Uh, uh, Answers that I have, and you gave me a lot of solutions to to in order to go further with our system. Okay, that's great. And I like to thank yeah. you for for this and for the very good job. Okay. Uh, we we operate uh, right now with uh, about uh, 750 car rental different car rental operators. Offering about twenty thousand different pickup points, mm -hmm. so as you can understand we we have everything in place, and our 
our next big step now is how we can we can increase our traffic okay. knowing that we we can do very very well on customer service and knowing that we can uh, we can uh, accelerate the information we get into good results for the for the visitors of of our website now we have to or three different segments here. One segment is that we want to concentrate on to our car rental suppliers because actually the car rental supplier is our client uh -huh. because we take a small commission through the prices they give us. Yeah. We, we have to satisfy them through the volumes that we give them in order to continue working with them. And from the other side, our clients are basically the visitors to our website that take in these products. What is your traffic level right now, Status? We have about uh, 300,000 300, visits a year. And what is the geographic uh, uh, distribution of your visitors today? At the moment, because our system only displays uh, English language, so the main the main ge geographical uh, visitors are from UAK, America, and mainly English-speaking languages countries. And the pickup points are also uh, UK and America mostly, or is it Europe as well? No, it's worldwide. Worldwide, okay. Mm -hmm. And is there any any demographic like is it? More male, more female, with uh, any age group? Do you, do you have any idea about who these people are? Yes, we have some demographics, and uh, as as you you have seen, if if you have visited the system, uh, the system is very very perfectly built on a matter of the relations in the database. So we have a very very fast system, and young people and people working with. Uh, uh, using the internet lately, uh, they like to use our system because it's very, very fast and the information comes out very, very quickly. Okay. Okay. And uh, tell me about the commission structure. Um, how much commission are you getting? What's, what's the business? Well, we, at the moment, we don't have a standard commission. We, we have the possibility, according to the, to the market demand, to play with the commission. But uh, I guess my question is, um, you know, one of the ways, I, I know your question uh, really is how do you improve your distribution? How do you get more traffic to the site and how do you get more people to transact? Uh, mm -hmm. One of that is by doing distribution deals with other large media portals, but those distribution deals typically amount to revenue sharing deals. Mm -hmm. And my question, I guess, is, the commission structure that you are putting in place or you have put in place, does that would that allow for doing revenue sharing? Yes, because we, we try to maximize on what we do. So we make sure that every new location we open, we find the best possible price and our commission structure is done like this so that we don't come up with more expensive price than our main competition. So our commission allows us to to have part of that market, but looking at the figures for the last past two years, we we see that the the, the conversion rates are standardized. So that means what I want to say is that we we see that it's all depending on on the amount of visitors we can have because every month or every quarter when we do our reports. We, we have a specific percentage of visitors converting into a real sale. All right. Okay, so this, uh, I think one of, the, I mean, there are multiple different ways of marketing. One of the ways of marketing which is going to be the highest leverage for you are distribution deals. And, uh, you know, in One Million by One Million, we do help our entrepreneurs with distribution deals, and, and uh, mm -hmm. I would be happy to work with you if you decide to join the program. But mm -hmm. that's one of the things that you should independently also look at as a possibility. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing is just 
getting more organic traffic into your site. I, I was so, so the ways to you know there's a there's a ro roster of things you can do to increase traffic to your site. One of them is organic search traffic. So you have to optimize your website to get search engine traffic. You have to you can do PPC, uh, pay per click advertising. Mm -hmm. That is expensive, and uh, you know, in in the in your case, um, my suspicion is it's going to be quite expensive actually to do PPC advertising, mm -hmm. um, because it's a crowded category. There's a there's a, all sorts of things going on. Um, I've talked mm -hmm. about distribution deals. You can do guerrilla PR. You have to figure out how you differentiate versus your other competitors, and mm -hmm. you know you can do a guerrilla PR campaign around that so that people start talking about it in in, in the geographies that you're trying to do business in, and mm -hmm. the travel websites and so forth. You can do that. Um, so there's a you know then there's social media marketing, all sorts of social media marketing that you can do, uh, including Facebook ads potentially. All of those are options. Um, and it will depend on what kind of budget you have and, and mm -hmm. a bit more about the competitive dynamics of your business as well. So, uh, mm -hmm. so those are my broad inputs. I'd have to look a lot more, uh, you know, look in a lot more detail at your business to be able to be more specific than that. But, uh, mm -hmm. but I think it's a, it's, it's a very competitive space. I think the biggest issue here is it's a very, very competitive space. Mm -hmm. Of course it is, yes. This is why we, we we concentrate in the past years in order to have this direct connectivity with all of our suppliers. So imagine that right now we are connected on a lifetime with about 750 car venture suppliers. We have a last minute uh, availability and uh, any company can uh, can uh, give us any information for for the fleet, and this is also done immediately. So we've done all this part, and now this is uh, why we we now need to concentrate on on the types of marketing we need to use in order to to expand more right. as much as the visibility we have on the internet. So SEO is definitely one of the areas that you need to look into very carefully. And, and SEO, the beauty of a good SEO strategy is, is you can you can do good SEO with a good content strategy. So there are opportunities to do content strategy, content partnerships, working with other uh, you know other content sites that have good um, you know good uh, good traffic as well. So that's one way to. To really improve the SEO uh, metrics, mm -hmm. in terms of conversion rates, at this stage, I would say one to two percent conversion rate is very good. Mm -hmm. You can get to four. So you think one or two percent is good? Yes. Yeah, one to two percent is good. If you can get to four or five percent, you're doing extremely well. Mm -hmm. um, so those are, I guess, those are the high-level answers to your questions. Mm -hmm. But I think in your case, I would I would look for distribution deals more than anything else. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, Samana. Yes, thank you very right. much. Okay, so we're going to do two more segments of the kind of transporting we've been uh, doing in the first segment. So one problem that is bugging me very much. And it is bugging a lot of entrepreneurs out there and a lot of large companies and a lot of one million by one million entrepreneurs is this issue of too much unmonetized ad inventory. Both mobile and online ad inventory is overflowing right now. And this is causing huge amount of problems. I have a series of points actually. Uh, if you go to, by the way, for all of these trend uh, pieces, there are blog posts supporting these in, on my blog. So you're very welcome to go there and, and participate in the discussions, ask questions, brainstorm with the community if you have ideas or questions on these topics. Um, so uh, Maureen, if you could 
put in the link for the different uh, segments that we are discussing in the public chat so that people can go to the blog post. That would be great. Um, so this one also, the unmonetized ad inventory, also has a blog post attached to it. And you will see a great discussion in there. In fact, some of the points that I'm going to show you are from that blog discussion where Vikrant Mathur, who is one of the 1 million by 1 million entrepreneurs, premium entrepreneurs, and he runs a company called iFood.tv. It's a very nice company. It's, a, it's kind of a food network online. It's a, it's a network of video recipes where chefs and um, serious cooks, both professionals and, and amateurs, are putting in video recipes. And uh, it's, a, it's a great community, very sticky community. He has excellent, very highly targeted ad inventory. But selling that ad, ad inventory is a, is a really uphill task. And, and I'll tell you why. Because typically, either you, to sell inventory, either you have a direct sales force, ad sales force, or you sell through ad networks. And most sites, unless they have hundreds of millions of um, you know, ad uh, impressions tend to sell, or hundreds of millions of uniques, they tend to sell through other networks like um, our blog. The ad inventory on our blog, even though it's a very premium audience, is sold through IDG uh, Tech Ad Network, and and that is uh, it's a it's an okay ad network and, and in fact they sell in ad inventory for a lot of the bigger tech sites as well Giga Ohm, Read Write Web. I think they're all they're selling ad inventory for all of those, but they don't really make any distinction in terms of premium versus uh, commodity inventory and and it's they're not able to sell high CPM ads. So what Vikram is saying here and these are Vikram Vikram's comments. It's becoming increasingly difficult for publishers to realize the true potential and value of their online audience. Um, publishers are seeing drop in CPMs. This is a very big compa complaint. You know, if you can if you can get two to four dollar CPMs, you're doing great. Whereas, really, to make money off ad in, ad revenues, you need to get to the twenty five to fifty dollar CPMs and and these numbers are becoming very, very difficult to get because there's such an oversupply of ad inventory. Publishers are also seeing ad networks imposing more stringent requirements, and those span all the way from sizes of ads and, and the kinds of things. Like one of the uh, one of the prob uh, ad requirements that I saw when IDG was placed as IDG places ads on my site is. They put these video ads, and the video goes on autoplay. Okay, so think about it for a reader, for an audience. My blog, this they come to my blog, and they immediately some random video starts playing, and that's an ad. It completely distracts from focusing on the blog itself, and it's unbelievably annoying. So I basically told IDG that, sorry, I'm not going to carry your video ads. And because they require that to monetize at a relatively high CPM rate, these autoplay video ads have to be placed, I lose that revenue. But from my point of view, I cannot piss off my audience. And these kinds of, these kinds of unreasonable stringent requirements are causing havoc in the publishers. The other thing we're seeing is poor fill rate. A lot of, you know, there's, there are two kinds of ads that get put on publisher websites. One is premium ads, which is decent CPM, and then there is the remnant ads, which is very low CPM. So if you have poor fill rates with the premium ads, the rest of the balanced ad inventory, remnant ad inventory, gets placed with commodity ad rates, and those are dreadful. They're like pennies, cents kind of ad rates, and um, it's just not worthwhile. And poor customer service from ad networks. Ad networks don't really uh, have the time to service this millions of publishers. There is a lot more publishers. And by the way, when I say publishers, 
I not only talk about media, I also talk about um, software companies that are doing apps. You know, you have mobile apps, you have social media apps. A lot of those are ad-supported business models. And they have the same issue of poor fill rates, stringent requirements from, um, from ad networks and poor customer service, and declining CPM rates. Exactly the same issue, and, and because we've seen so much freemium uh, businesses coming up on the internet, you know, people are giving so much stuff for free, assuming that they're going to monetize with ads. There, this is what has caused the glut in ad inventory. As a result, you know, publishers are seeing no differentiation in, even if you have a differentiated audience, even if you have a high value audience. Ad networks are not able to sell that audience in a differentiated way to get you premium pricing on your ad inventory. And these standard units, you know, they have these uh, little rectangular blocks or the leaderboard or the um, skyscraper ads. But if you go outside of those standard units, if you have, if you want to do something more creative and insert something in the middle of a uh, of a blog post or a or an article, you can't do those things because the uh, the ad networks do not supply ad inventory outside of the standard units of skyscraper, scraper, leaderboard, and uh, rectangular ad blocks. And and from the ad network side, all they can do is serve products that can sell, that can that can scale, that is applicable to a very large number of. Uh, publishers, so they they limit what they sell to very standard blocks. So that's kind of uh, that's my overview of the problem. Now, what is the solution? I thought about this a lot because um, I, you know I've been following this industry for many many years, and right around 2007, something interesting happened. Actually, the phenomenon of vertical ad networks came about. And if you haven't tracked the vertical ad network phenomenon, this is actually one of the more interesting trends that happened in advertising, in online advertising, over the last five years. Um, so basically, vertical ad networks were ad networks that were selling inventory of, with, with specialization in certain verticals. A great example of this is glam media. Glam Media basically rolled up online publishers in the fashion and lifestyle vertical. And they, they, this included blogs, included you know, online magazines, online glossies, and you know, all sorts of people in the operating, publishers operating in the fashion and lifestyle business, it included search engines in some cases, or other uh, properties like that, and they started serving ads to these particular publishers. And on the flip side, they had a, they've developed a good ad sales force that can sell brand advertising to all the leading fashion and lifestyle brands. And that's where the name Glam comes from. A similar one is Travel Ad Network that focuses on the travel vertical. Um, IDG does the tech vertical. Um, so there are a bunch of these different uh, vertical ad networks, and this has this created some uh, level of uh, you know it improved inventory, uh, it, it improved CPM rates by a bit, but still the uh, when it comes to mid-sized publishers, when these guys operate with very large publishers, they do well. Like for instance, if Glam Media were to represent you know, a 30 million impression or 30 million unique site, or a Vogue, for instance, they would behave differently than when they're representing small or mid-sized publishers. So the small or mid-sized publishers are really getting killed in the process. And that's where there's an opportunity for building ad networks that represent the smaller or mid-sized um, publishers and selling premium rates 
for those, on behalf of those small or mid-sized publishers. So for instance, if you have expertise in the area of advertising, online advertising, and especially ad selling, you could conceivably come up with an ad network that is able to serve, or sell rather, 25 to 50 dollar CPMs for premium mid-sized publishers. And this could include us, for instance, if you take us as an example, our audience is actually a premium audience. It's a very, very high level audience. It's entrepreneurs, it's CEOs, it's um, thought leaders, it's big executives in, in companies. But we don't get any premium for any of that. And what Vikram's saying about iFood TV is iFood TV has, again, a very, very good audience. It's people really engaged in the food and cooking vertical. And so if you have a, have a set of customers, a set of advertisers who want to sell to the food and cooking vertical, the inventory that, the ad inventory that Vikrant has is a prize ad inventory. But somebody has to explain to the advertiser the value of a smaller, let's say, 3 million, 4 million unique kind of ad inventory that is really deep and really targeted and be able to extract the higher CPMs by selling that site particularly. And that is completely missing from the, uh, from the audience, uh, from the landscape. So if you're looking for a business idea, this is definitely one of them. So I will open up my public chat, and, and if you want to discuss this particular business idea, I'd be happy to take questions or, or brainstorm with you. So if you want to discuss the too much unmonetized ad inventory problem, come and, uh, come and use the public chat, and, and feel free to brainstorm about it. Now, um, by the way, do not use the Q&A to ask questions. I'm not monitoring the q and I'm only monitoring the public chat. So don't, don't use the Q&A panel. Yvette, I saw that you put a question in about uh, the previous segment in the Q&A panel. When we get back to general Q&A, please cut and paste that question into the chat, uh, chat panel and I will answer your question. Any, any thoughts, any comments on this segment? I guess nobody is in the advertising area. All right, we're going to move on to the next segment, which again has a blog post called Indian Product Entrepreneurs, Your Time Has Come. Now, I will again give you some context of where this comment comes from. You know, for years and years and years, I would say at least two decades, India has been the world's back office. India has done great work in the outsourcing industry and has built a massive, multi-billion dollar outsourcing industry, which works really well, actually. It has created a huge growth in, in the Indian industry, and it is, it's been a very net positive, huge net positive for India in general. And um, that's where this comment comes from, is that India, however, has got stuck in this mode of outsourcing and uh, offshore development or business process outsourcing kind of businesses. India has not really matured to also include technology product companies in its fold. And this is something that I have felt very strongly about because I went to, uh, actually, I, uh, when I went to India in 1995 uh, to start my first company, 
I was really interested in doing a product company. Because I came out of MIT as a computer scientist, and I really didn't want to do an outsourcing company at that point. I was much more keen on doing a product company. And it was really not easy. I did do, I did do a product company, and Tarka was my second company, which was a product company. I raised venture capital from Silicon Valley and everything. But it was very, very difficult. I mean, we, uh, we were getting rejected by VCs because we were building a product in um, – in the uh, basically building a product in India. And I could not convince the VCs at the time that it is actually a lot cheaper to do, um, to build products in India. And it, it's an obvious, it seems completely obvious right now, but at that time people thought it was too risky for a company which has IP and product uh, engineering to have the entire engineering team in India. And I kept telling them, look, I have built my first product for $300,000. I just could not do that because it's a complex product. There's no way I could do this if I had to have this entire engineering team in Silicon Valley. And this I'm talking 1997-98 time frame. I had 30 engineers in India. Cost structure was lower at the time. And I was able to do, I was able to build this product for $300,000 and and I, I, I just couldn't understand why this did not sink in with the VCs. Well, <laughs> fast forward about, I would say maybe six, seven, eight years. In the mid-2000 decade, the situation completely flipped. Every VC was asking, at the moment you go to a VC to raise money, they will ask you, what is your India strategy? Are you building products in India? How much of your engineering are you doing in India? Well, you know, this was also another extreme. So the mode of companies building products in Silicon Valley, doing the product marketing in Silicon Valley, and doing development offshore, having an engineering team in India, this model became popular. By the mid-2000s, this model became very popular. And the, the real question, however, was, can you really build a product company out of India? So the first really big example, success story, that I spotted was the example of a company called Zoho. And many of you are probably familiar with Zoho, and uh, that is probably the, in, the biggest role model for Indian entrepreneurs today. And what the entrepreneur behind uh, Zoho is Sridhar Vembu. What Sridhar was able to do was do the entire product in India. And he, today, this is a 100 million plus company competing with Salesforce.com in the CRM area. They basically undercut the price point of CRM by, um, you know, a lot. They, they charge one-sixth of what, uh, what uh, Salesforce.com charges for a CRM system, and they have been able to build a hundred million plus company. Um, and this company has over a thousand people in Chennai, and that's they hardly have, you know, fifteen people, fewer than fifteen people in in the Bay Area. So their entire product is done in uh, in India, and they have actually been able to build a real product company out of India. And this is the role model that a lot of entrepreneurs in India, a lot of product entrepreneurs in India, not services, product entrepreneurs in India are looking up to right now. I wrote the Zoho story. I kind of unveiled the Zoho story in Forbes in 2008, in February 2008. That was probably the unveiling of Zoho to the world, and since then Zoho has got a tremendous amount of publicity and coverage. The Economist did a story on Zoho. And the big thing to learn from Zoho is that it's a SaaS company, software as a service company. And what they've done is taken an existing category, a very established existing category like CRM, and they have drastically dropped the price point on it to make that software as a service offering affordable for very small companies. And it's basically, I, I term this opportunity affordable SaaS, and I think for India, 
this is a very, very good opportunity. So that brings me to the Freshdesk story. Freshdesk is a 1 million by 1 million company. I talked about them in the last roundtable and I actually have written a few pieces recently about them. One of the reasons is because they just raised money from a top tier venture firm called Axel Partners. Freshdesk is doing a similar strategy of this affordable SaaS out of India, catering to the customer support space. And uh, the customer support space also has software and service solutions already. But these solutions are a lot more expensive than the price point at which Freshdesk is offering the solution. So this is a very, very interesting strategy of how to build a company, especially out of India. The Indian cost structure still is significantly lower than a Silicon Valley cost structure, an American cost structure, an European cost structure, and so forth. Even a Latin American cost structure is significantly higher than an Indian cost structure. So you could potentially build a company in this space, in any space actually, by significantly changing the cost structure and the pricing structure. You get the cost structure advantage because of India, and as a result, you can pass on the profitability or you can pass on the cost structure advantage with a pricing model that get, passes on that advantage to the customers. And this is a very, very interesting opportunity for this decade. The 2010 to 2020 decade is something that is going to give you an opportunity to play in this space. So let me look at some of the comments in the chat. Priyanka Mukherjee says, I also started my product, shopfordesigns.com, in 2008 and tried to undercut the price point of 99designs.com. At the time, 99designs.com was also a fresh startup as mine, but they scaled up well, but we could not. And, and why do you think you were not able to do that? You're sending me private messages. Please don't send me private messages. Uh, turn your send to to all participants. Um, so, so Priyanka, tell me more about why, why do you think your, your project did not work out? And by the way, this is open for discussion. This topic is completely open for discussion. Today, I think Freshdesk is just one company that is coming up um, in this genre. We have a lot of companies like this in our 1 million by 1 million program. And I think there are. this is a style of business that is going to be quite in vogue, quite a trend in, in the 2012 onwards time frame. And it's already, already starting to become a bit of a trend. Priyanka says he bootstrapped his business and did not have the funding for AdWords and publicity that they had. But that is not the only way to do, uh, to do uh, business, Priyanka. You bootstrap businesses work fine. You have to do the things right in a bootstrap business. We continuously work with bootstrap businesses. You have to bootstrap business to a point where you can raise money. Even to raise funding, you have to bootstrap your business up to a point. Any other comments, questions? So Priyanka, if you want to, you know, want help with your business, you should join One Million by One Million. We'll be happy to help you build that business. We know a lot about that kind of businesses. We see those kinds of businesses all the time. We are big users of those kinds of businesses. The 1 million by 1 million participants are users of those kinds of businesses. You can even market through the 1 million by 1 million channel to the 1 million by 1 million community. These are the kinds of businesses that can be built by using, leveraging the 1M, 1M channel as well. Um, let me see. There's a whole bunch of questions that just rolled by. So bootstrap to what level is a question. Bootstrap to, you can bootstrap all the way. We have a, uh, you know, we have a case study running on the blog right now where the entrepreneurs bootstrapped to $25 million before raising $23 million in financing. 
So you can, depending on your business, depending on your tenacity, depending on your on the dynamics of your business, you can bootstrap to a you know a very long way. Some businesses are bootstrapped to 100 million dollars. Sridhar Vembu Zoho is bootstrapped to 100 million dollar plus. Sridhar is never going to raise money because right now he's immensely profitable. On the other hand, Fresh Desk bootstrapped to paying customers, and we've just raised money from Axel Partners, a million dollars from Axel Partners, they, have, they already have paying customers. So it's completely validated. They have a good understanding of the dynamics of the business. They know what price point the customers are tolerating. They have happy customers, and now they raise money based on a validated business, basically, all the way to paying customers. Um, so Priyanka, we're going to have to look at, I need to look at your business. Um, in more detail and the nuances of your business and the details of your business to be able to help you more. And I'll be happy to do that. You're most welcome to join the program. Let me quickly go through um, some of the questions that just ran by. John Schindler, do you think that Elance and Odesk are the best places to reach out to and engage India teams for product development? What are other channels? One of the other channels is one million by one million. We have vendors uh, in the One Million by One Million program that you can work with as well. And of course, Odesk, Elance, Guru.com, uh, there are a variety of different places you can go for that as well. You can provide us with some info about the systems that offer CPM. I'm, I don't understand the question status. Are you talking about ad networks that sell ads on behalf of publishers, Stephis? Um, in your vertical, travel ad network would be a very good one. I don't know what their minimum traffic requirements are, but that is a possibility for you. Mohan says, apart from price points, what are the important things to focus? You need to do competitive analysis and you need to do market analysis to see where the market trends are. One of the things Freshdesk has done very successfully is that they latched on to the social CRM trends. Social CRM is a major trend for this decade and they have built into their product extensive social media integration. So their product is not only cheaper, but it's also integrated into the full social media, social CRM trend. So it's, it's a cutting edge product with differentiated functionality as well, not just price points. So you can, it's better that you don't only differentiate on price. It's better that you differentiate on price and performance. Um, so these days you did not have good experience dealing with Elance and Odesk. You know, I can tell you, we use Elance and Odisk all the time. It's a, for us, it's a very, very successful uh, channel of, um, of service. But John, you can also use some of the developers in the program, in the One Million by One Million program. We have developers who are members of One Million by One Million. Mohan says, but not every other product might not need social media. Right, it depends on what your product is. Absolutely. It's a valid comment. John, uh, if you're looking for out what you're talking about, using India teams for product development, there's a whole module in the team building uh, section of the one million by one million curriculum. You should go there and there is a whole uh, coverage of a topic called outsourced product development. In outsourced product development, I explain a lot about how to deal with uh, offshore teams and all that. And there are references to people you can call and connect with and, and uh, you, have, you, you have the contacts, you have the their information and everything. Okay.
Bianca says sites like Elance are good for buyers and employers. I don't think that's necessarily true. It's also true for vendors because if you go to uh, go to the to my blog, you'll see I ran a story, a case study called Million Dollar Fle Freelancer, about a guy in Gujarat, uh, Sanjay Dhange. He's doing a million dollars a year business from uh, Gujarat selling on Elance and Freelancer.com and, and Odesk, these kinds of uh, portals, exchanges. Okay. All right. I'm going to do um, a quick segment on 1 million by 1 million itself. So here's one of my call to actions. Um, so Sudhi is saying one last question. Sudhi, hold your questions. I'm going to do... If there is time, there will be time actually. There's, I, I will be able to do some more questions uh, later on in the show. Let me finish the one million by one million segment because some of you are, some of you need to understand how to work with one million by one million. So let me cover that and then we'll get back to Q and A again. And you can ask any questions you want. So one of the, one of my calls to calls to action to you, if you are finding this forum useful is bring 10 serious entrepreneurs into 1 million by 1 million. As I said right at the outset, we cannot make the kind of difference that we've set out to make with 1 million by 1 million without serious entrepreneurs who have the tenacity and the metal to be successful, to put in the work and the, you know, the seriousness it requires to be a successful entrepreneur. We cannot do this without finding serious entrepreneurs like that. So we need your help in locating those entrepreneurs and bringing them into the program. So please help us. I, I say this with absolute and complete humility. We need your help. So uh, let me take you through a, a segment explaining how we work with our entrepreneurs, with the 1 million by 1 million entrepreneurs, and what resources we have prepared for you. So the first the starting point for the uh, for the program is the blog, which is completely free. I, you know, I constantly rattle off case studies and, and articles and so forth. All that is, is available on the blog for free. You can go to the blog and, and look up any case study you want to. The second piece is the Entrepreneur Journeys book series. We have a four-volume Entrepreneur Journeys series, which is a combination of case studies and some synthesis of core philosophies of 1 million by 1 million. And these are all written in a very inspirational and educational format. They're all available in Amazon, Kindle, and in India you can also order it through Flipkart. Um, bootstrapping and positioning are two cornerstone philosophies of 1 million by 1 million. We want you to bootstrap as much as possible, and we want you to do very, very sharp, laser sharp positioning. And we te teach you how to do both very effectively. So, so those are two volumes of Entrepreneur Journey's bootstrapping weapon of mass reconstruction and positioning how to test, validate, and bring your idea to market. But across the four volumes, these philosophies kind of run through. So you can definitely use the book series, whether it's physical books or e-books, to get familiar with some of the basic principles of the program. Um, the next thing we offer are these free roundtables. This is our 107th roundtable. We've had over 7,000, 8,000 actually people who have attended these roundtables. I've personally coached over 500 entrepreneurs. So we have a lot of experience in helping you steer you in, in the right directions through these roundtables. And as you heard Status say, he has been watching, he watched 10 roundtables and picked up what he could and implemented those and then came to me with further questions. So if you follow these roundtables on a regular basis, you learn a lot through, those, through the roundtables. In addition, we have the premium program. So aside from those free resources, we also have a $1,000 annual membership fee. It's like a club. And once you join this club, there's a set of things that you can use on an unlimited basis. We have an extensive methodology guidance, and that methodology is taught through a curriculum. 
We have a very, very strong curriculum that is a case study and video lecture-based curriculum that you can absorb at your own time. It is fully available online. We do a lot of business development work. We do distribution deals with media companies. We do um, you know, other kinds of channel deals. If you're trying to sell to enterprises, you're trying to sell to small businesses, there's all sorts of channel opportunities that we create for you. And we connect you to customers. We also connect you to direct customers. We help you find customers. So business development is, a, is again, another core philosophy of the program. We want you to find customers as much as possible and get to revenue as soon as possible, rather than raising lots of financing. And we have private versions of members-only versions of these roundtables where we delve deep into your business. The difference between a free public roundtable and the private roundtable is as follows. You get the benefit of the curriculum, and you can prepare yourself using that curriculum quite significantly before you come to discuss anything with me. So by the time you come to discuss with me at a private roundtable, you would have taught yourself a lot of things that are important for you to learn because of the curriculum. So the discussion that you and I are going to have when you come to talk to me at a private roundtable is going to be a much higher order, much more sophisticated discussion because you've already absorbed a bunch of the basics based on the curriculum modules. And of course we help you with financing. We are, you know, we are announcing financing. We have a number of deals in financing right now. So you know, this is a given. We help you with financing, but we don't want you to go try to raise money without being prepared because you are going to get rejected. 99, over 99% of the deals that go out to raise money get rejected. So you have to prepare yourself before you can raise money. And we do a lot of work in the domain of PR and analyst relations. We have great media presence and we let you access that media presence both in terms of you know, social media, blogs, mainstream media, all sorts of things, but definitely we give you access to our media presence and media channels when you're a member of One Million by One Million. So if you are trying to announce something, let's say you're announcing a new product, you're announcing a new, uh, you know, uh, you're announcing a round of financing, whatever, we can get you immense amount of coverage just because of our ability and our reach into this market. So as you come into the program, if you join, premium, join the premium program, one of the first things we're going to have you do is take this 1 million by 1 million self-assessment. And for every assessment item, we have curriculum modules for you to absorb. So wherever you have gaps here in your understanding of those topics, you can fill those gaps by going through the curriculum modules. As a result, if you spend, let's say, a weekend right after, let's say you join today. You can spend Friday, Saturday, Sunday absorbing the self-assessment and you will, on Monday, I guarantee you, you're going to feel much better about yourself. <laughs> Whatever business you're trying to build, this self-assessment and just going through the curriculum related to that is going to get you to a much more sophisticated understanding of how to build a business. And then you can access the other pieces of the curriculum there's lots more in the curriculum. There are the private roundtables. You can continue to use the free private or public roundtables. There are all sorts of other ways you can use the program, but I guarantee you in a very, very short time, you'll feel better. And that's, that feeling better and giving you confidence is one of our objectives. We want you to feel confident. We want you to feel not only inspired, but equipped and empowered to execute on what you need to execute to be a successful entrepreneur. The site is 1m1m.stromanometer.com. Um, I also encourage you to look at the tabs on the top right corner, uh, Premium Program, FAQ. These are places where you will find a lot more ex explanation of how to use the Premium Program, how to leverage the Premium Program. Definitely look at those. Our methodology is Lean Capital Efficient Bootstrap Startups. You have to be lean and bootstrapped and capital efficient to get to a milestone where either you can raise money or you can become profitable. Those are the options. 
And even to raise money, you have to go through a rather lengthy bootstrapping phase before any investor is going to even consider you. So we help you understand all these nuances of financing, of what you need to do to even get money. So here's a, a little bit more about the curriculum. We have seven core modules, bootstrapping, positioning, market sizing, customer validation, financing, customer acquisition, and team building. And then we have electives. And electives are aligned with the trends in the industry, whether you're building a web business, web 3.0 and e-commerce is a trend, cloud computing is a big trend, cloud computing and business solutions, outsourcing and consulting continues to be a big trend. You'll see what, what are the trends in that business, so you can decide if you want to build an outsourcing business where you want to position it. Mobile and social apps is a very big trend. Healthcare, IT, online education, online gaming, uh, all these are big trends and, and we covered those in separate elective modules. Case studies of several hundred successful entrepreneurs and video lectures, associated video lectures, is what constitutes the core curriculum and the elective modules. And these case studies are there are over 500 case studies that we've built over the last five years. We started building case studies in 2006. And I've sat down with successful entrepreneurs, with thought leaders, and collected their thoughts and their journeys. They have shared in excruciating detail how they have been successful, what strategies have they followed, and have synthesized all this into a, an incredibly powerful curriculum. So if you study this curriculum, you not only get a tremendous amount of education, you also get inspiration because as one of the entrepreneurs, Didi Ganguly says, man can do what man has done. Entrepreneurs before you have been successful and they're sharing their learnings and experience with you through me. So in a sense, the One Million by One Million program is being taught by over 500 entrepreneurs, not just by me. And take advantage of that. There is nothing like this out there. Yes, and they discuss, Priyankar says uh, it helps to study failure stories. They shared their failures. There's one guy, Ashar Aziz, who says he raised $10 million and blew through all of that and didn't get to a milestone. The company went out of business. He explains what happened. You need to learn things like that. Raising money is not the holy grail. Building a successful business is the holy grail. You don't want to blow through money. Once you raise money, you don't want to blow through that money. You need to do the right things in the right order, right sequence. As I said, we do a lot of business development work. This is an announcement that got coverage in Business Standard about a deal between Persistent, one million by one million, and two uh, companies, Orinscape and Crowd Engineering. They're still working with Persistent. Um, we do, as I said, we do a lot of media work. So this is an article that I wrote on Read Write Web about one of our one million by one million companies positioning as they're feeling, filling a gap in Google's enterprise solution. Since then, they are actually doing a deal with Google. Um, this is another entrepreneur, Ram Kumar, who says he blew through, he raised a lot of angel financing. He's writing me on my Facebook page and saying, I raised a lot of angel financing and I blew through all the money. I wish we, I had access to one million by one million three years ago when I raised the money. We work with a lot of incubators. So if you, are, if you represent an incubator or a, or a fund that is trying to run an incubator in addition to your fund, you're very welcome to work with us. We partner very well. We, uh, we, are, we have a lot of incubator partnerships around the world right now. MAD is one in Malaysia. We also have an affiliate program. We can, uh, we, we basically give 10% uh, affiliate fee, uh, pay 10% affiliate fee to all our affiliate partners. You can go to the affiliate page. There's an, uh, on the 1M1M site, there's a page on how to work with, uh, within the affiliate program. And uh, the upcoming free roundtables, there are two more this year, December 15th and December 22. 22nd, and then January 5th, 12th, 19th, and 26th uh, are going to be the next free roundtable. So uh, please book your slot to pitch and prepare to pitch uh, if you want to. And, uh, and if you want to get going with the curriculum and so on and so forth, 
please come and work with us in the premium program. John Schindler is saying, as a premium member, I would attest that these case studies are especially good because Romana has approached these successful founders with specific topics in mind, good positioning of sorts. Not just letting them talk about their success, but getting at real kernels of value in how they made it to success. This is a very, very astute observation, John. And of course, John is using the curriculum on a regular basis, so he speaks from experience, and, and it's, it's absolutely true. You know, I went about it, and I'm still going about it. By the way, we develop probably every year, we develop 100 case studies. So I'm continuing to develop case studies on your behalf, and in every single case study, we, we don't let, let these interview candidates, the successful startup founders, ramble. When they start rambling, I immediately bring them back on specific topics of how did you do it. Oh, I, I, oh we got to $5 million revenue by you know, year three. How did you get to $5 million in revenue? It's not a joke to get to $5 million in revenue. You have to tell me exactly how you got, got there step by step. How did you position? How, what marketing uh, strategies did you use? What business development strategies did you use? This, we go into very, very, very much detail about exactly how they put one foot before the other. That's really important. Uh, Lori English has some issues which Maureen may need to deal with. I have no idea what she's talking about. Um, Let's see, anybody else, any other comments, questions? While you're, going, while you're putting more of your comments and questions on the public chat, um, I'm gonna ask, share with you another uh, piece of resource. If you are interested in India, you know, leveraging India to build a business. India is very hot right now, you know, as, a, as an entrepreneurial opportunity, India is very hot. Um, I have a book called Vision India 2020 that articulates $45 billion business ideas. And it's written as if we are sitting in 2020, having built these businesses. So it goes into, again, granular details about strategy and execution. So if you want to work on one of these ideas, we actually have a module in One Million by One Million called Vision India 2020. And I'm looking for entrepreneurs to execute on these ideas because it's not possible for me to execute on 45 more billion dollar ideas. We're working on one million by one million, which in itself is a billion dollar idea. And then we have these other 45 ideas. You're very welcome to come and work on any of them and I'll be happy to connect all the dots for you on that as well. Priyanka says the retail market in India is booming, most certainly, and e-commerce is gonna boom in India as well. So um, anybody else, any other questions? Um, I saw a question earlier that I would like to answer in the Q and A. If you could please, um, if you could please place your questions, uh, lift, cut and paste your questions from Q and A, which is privately sending questions to me. Uh, please place them in the public chat, and I will be very happy to answer. Yvette says, "This is the question I posted in the Q and A. We are a corporate finance and strategy firm, and there is constant discussion about." lead generation. Is there specific information regarding how much business can be generated through social media contacts? Depends on what kind of customers you work with, Yvette. If you work with entrepreneurs of a you know, certain um, size, there is definitely entrepreneurs hanging out in, the, in social media. There's no question that entrepreneurs are hanging out in social media. I don't know what, uh, what kind of specific information you're looking for, but, um, but business, B2B lead generation on social media is definitely a reality. It's happening in a very significant way. Priyanka says Flipkart is a big success story. Yes, and the Flipkart case study is available on my blog. If you're interested in understanding how Flipkart has been navigating its way, that's definitely uh, that's definitely available. So Yvette, the way to get to solid leads is to create enough of a social media presence so such that leads come to you. Like I explained earlier, um, people 
email me on Twitter, you know, in direct message on Twitter or email me on Facebook, and they tell me that they are, they are interested in joining One Million by One Million, and I direct them to, you know, sometimes to Irina, sometimes to the site, on how to join. So we constantly see inbound leads coming through social media because of our very extensive social media presence. You can, by the way, go look at, uh, as, to get a flavor of our social media strategy, you can go on the 1M1M website, and there is a, there is a, uh, on the right panel, on the uh, right panel, there is a button called Twitter. You can look at our Twitter strategy there. Yvette, I, it's, you know, I can help you more if you, you know, if you join the 1M1M program, I can help you more um, with specifics of your business. It's hard to work in generali generalities before, beyond a certain point. Priyanka says, is there any service way to monitor tweets and send me notification when a particular keyword appears on any of the tweets? Um, there probably is. Uh, the, this is actually this whole area of um, Twitter analytics or social media analytics is another open area. We will discuss that uh, sometime soon. Uh, it's something that needs to be, uh, it's, there's lots of opportunities for uh, building companies around the Twitter analytics space and social media analytics space. And there is a lot of startup activity going on there as well. So you're going to have to do some research to find what you're looking for. Anybody else? Any other questions or comments? All right, then um, Irina, if you could once more put your contacts in the public chat. Folks, those of you who want to investigate further on whether you want to join 1M1M Premium or not, please feel free to call or Skype or email Irina and she will be happy to get on the phone or Skype with you and answer your questions and help you understand the program further. And uh, of course you can, uh, there's, I pointed you to a whole bunch of online resources through which you can do your due diligence. The program is working rather well. We have a lot of success stories and uh, we are, we just announced one funding. We have a number of fundings in, in swing right now. Um, we have a number of companies that are doing great revenue wise. This morning I got a, um, got a little graph, revenue graph from Dan Stewart in uh, Florida. His company is Happy Grasshopper. He just showed me his revenue ramp chart and this month um, the revenue went up to $10,000 a month and, and it's, it's a wonderful chart. And I, I just felt so good receiving that chat, chart from Dan because he's been kind of following the One Million by One Million program as a, in a textbook way. He's just following very systematically exactly the methodology and, and it's working and that's really wonderful to see. Yeah, John is here. I think Mukul Mehta is here. Um, I think I saw Mukul earlier. Um, several One Million by One Million premium entrepreneurs are here. So anyway, we are here to help you if you want to um, use us, please feel free. And as Maureen says, if you lost audio at any point and um, need to you know, revisit what was discussed, the uh, recording is going to be available on the blog within, within the hour. And you can go back and replay the recording and catch up on whatever you missed. This is why we provide the recording. Okay, folks. John, your point is, is well taken. Uh, the only thing is we often come up with the discussion topics very late in the game because um, we, have to, we have to juggle a lot of the pitches and so on and so forth. Anyway, don't worry about it, but we, your point is well taken that giving some um, idea about 
um, who, you know, what topics are going to get discussed is, would be helpful, yes. I'm actually thinking that maybe in every session we're going to put at least one discussion item going forward, and we will pre-announce that. That's, that's a good idea. Okay. All right. I will uh, let you guys get on with your day, and uh, good luck with everybody's businesses, and uh, we will see you next week. A private roundtable is on Wednesday. Public roundtable is on Thursday, and I uh, will see some of you at the private roundtables and many of you at the public roundtables. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for joining.